You're listening to the Makers and Mystics podcast. This is your host, Stephen Roach. This is season three, episode eight. Thanks for joining us on Makers and Mystics. We have a special episode planned for you today. And this episode is special not only because I get to introduce you to a fellow artist from our hometown here in Greensboro, but also because for this episode, I have my beautiful wife Sarah here with me to co-host the show. She's going to keep my heresies in check and be sure that this train stays on track. (laughs) That's a very big job. It is a big job, but (laughs) I believe in you. You've been doing it for 13 years, so don't let me down today. Before we introduce our guest, I wanted to remind everyone that tickets for the Breath in the Clay Creative Arts Gathering are still currently on sale. And I should mention that some of our workshops are starting to fill up. So if you haven't gotten your tickets yet, you can go to thebreathintheclay.com and get those tickets today. Also, if you are a patron of the Makers and Mystics podcast, you do receive discounted registration to the conference. So become a patron, support the podcast, and get tickets at a discounted price. Today, our guest is author, listener, and creative director, Emily Freeman. Emily is the Wall Street Journal best-selling author of four books, including Simply Tuesday and A Million Little Ways. She's the host of the podcast called The Next Right Thing, and is the co-founder of a community for writers called Hope Writers. She's also a teacher of an online course called Create and Complete, and her goal is to help people live as wholehearted creatives in their faith, their work, and their relationships. Emily is currently pursuing a master's in spiritual formation and leadership from Friends University in Kansas. This is our conversation with author Emily Freeman, a creative liturgy for everyday life. Well, Emily, it's a real treat to have you on Makers and Mystics, and we've really enjoyed getting to know your work and getting to know you over the past couple of years, and just you were at the second Breath in the Clay that we ever did, and I still get comments on how impacting your message is, because we have that one. Matter of fact, it was the second episode that I ever released of Makers and Mystics was your keynote talk, and so it's a real joy to have you here, and just a real joy to have another local artist be a part of what we're doing. Well, I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I know that most of the people from the circles that follow our work would know you from your book, A Million Little Ways, which was super impacting for me when I read it. But I also know that you have a blog that's just Emily P. Freeman. And then you also started your own podcast recently. And uh, I'd love for you to tell people about that. I did. Well, it's the podcast is called The Next Right Thing. And it's funny, Stephen, because I thought that might be my next book. And so I started sort of working on the whole idea was, I feel like I hear best from God when I have a huge decision to make. And so sometimes it's like my radar's up. It's almost like when you're, like when you get pregnant or when you are going to buy a new car and you're like, oh, I think I like Toyotas. You see Toyotas everywhere? Right. (laughs) Well, that's how it was with this idea of being in the midst of having a decision to make. And I feel like our antennas are always up, like we're looking for advice from friends and we're asking family and we're really open in prayer. And so I started trying to take notes on this idea of what, what does it look like to take my next right step with confidence when I'm not sure what's coming? And it was not coming out as a book. And it was really hard because I thought, I'm a writer. This is what I do. And I, I sat with the idea for quite some time, and I realized that this idea didn't want to be written. It wanted to be spoken. And so that is when I started to realize, okay, I think this might be an audio offering and audio offerings lend themselves really well to podcasts. Yeah. So it is a podcast for the chronically hesitant, the second guessers, and anyone who struggles with decision fatigue. Oh, I love it. That's amazing. And you can find that on iTunes? Yes, you can. Okay. Yeah. All right. Perfect. I'll put a link to that in the notes on this episode so people can find you there as well. I know that a lot of what you do with your work is that you help people uncover that creative DNA that's inside of them. And I think that, you know, a lot of times the words creativity and art, 
people take them as synonymous, but that can also create some intimidation in people who don't identify themselves as artists. Right. But at the same time, I think you and I both would agree that there's even a theological base for why creativity is a part of who we are as human beings. So can you talk a little bit about how you approach uncovering that creative part of people that wouldn't consider themselves artists? Well, I think, not to go too far back, but if you think about the very beginning when God created the world, the first thing we know about about Him is that He created. He didn't save it for the weekend. He didn't do it when He just had extra time. It was the number one priority. And the very first thing we know about us is that we are made in His image. So if we are made in the image of a creative God, then all that means to me is that we are creative people, period, without explanation. It, it, and nothing further needs to be had. There doesn't have to be a special skill or a special gifting. It's just because we are And so having said that, I know that when we use the word art, a lot of people think painting, singing, sculpting, dancing, and all of those are art for sure. But um, if you think about the work that we offer every day, you know, in reality, if if you were to like really pin me down, does the world need another song? I don't know. We've got a lot of songs, you know? Maybe we don't, but here's what I think the world does need. The world needs people who have come alive. Mm -hmm. And if songwriting makes you come alive, then boy, you better do it. Because that is what makes us, as co-creators with Christ, that's what makes us come alive and therefore share who He is and move towards others as creative people. And so wouldn't it be a beautiful thing if we all were open and willing to explore those things that made us come alive for the glory of God and the benefit of others. Yeah. I know even in our own journey, that has played out firsthand because for a number of years, we owned a business. It was a window cleaning, a pressure washing business, not a creative, you know, bent or whatever. And it was a mixed blessing because on one hand, it freed us up to do what we wanted to pursue. But then as it grew, it also became kind of this over-encompassing thing. And so there was a challenge in our lives to do the responsible things that we need to do in life, which we all have to do, you know, and at the same time to keep and to nurture that creative part of us alive. Like, what have you learned in your journey about how the mundane every day interacts with that creative part of who you are? It's such a great question, and I think you're right. I think that is a tension that we all really hold. Yeah. Um, And as a side note, I bet you we could find a window washer person <laughs> who considered themselves an artist. Yeah. That that was their art. Yeah, yeah. That the washing of the windows was their thing that makes them come alive. Yeah. It Maybe it seems crazy, yeah. but I guarantee you there's some in the, yeah. in the world. And so just that just goes to show that it's not... It's not really the outcome of what the thing is. It's really something that's happening on the inside, and the art is the evidence. Mm, I love that. And so whatever the thing is, whether it's a book or a sculpture or a, a, a child who's growing or something that we have made with our hands that was first thought of in our heads yeah. and in our hearts, whatever comes out, that is, an, that is evidence that art has happened on the inside. Yeah. And so all of those mundane things, and, and here's the thing about that is... All of those those places, those everyday, ordinary things, if you imagine the most wonderful day of your life, you could probably come up with something pretty quickly. And if I asked you to imagine the most difficult day of your life, you could probably also come up with something pretty quickly. Yeah. But if I ask you to tell me what you did three Tuesdays ago, yeah. you might have to think about it. Yeah. But the truth is, most of our life is lived on those three Tuesdays ago. Mm. That's where most of our moments happen, because most of life happens not in the bright joy of excitement or in the darkness of sorrow, but it happens in the medium light of a regular day. And so if that's where I live, then that's where my art is going to happen, both where I'm going to be informed with what I want to create and what I'm creating with my life and also what I'm going to offer. That's where I'm going to offer it. And I think we can despise the smallness of that, but I think there's also a, a sacred invitation to receive those small moments as almost like um, almost like a liturgy of yeah, life to I sort of it. walk into these spaces as the person I most fully am yeah. and offer myself and what I have in my hands and, and leave the outcomes to a God who knows more than I do and trust that he's going to do something with it that maybe I won't see. Yeah, that's really good. You made me think Matt, Tommy, and I had a conversation here a few episodes ago that was about process versus product. 
and how art is more of a process than a product. But I love looking at your art as the evidence. Yes. And that's a much more beautiful way to word that than product. I love it as being the evidence. That's really cool. Yeah, it kind of takes the um it takes the pressure off a little bit. Yeah. That I'm not I mean I can get really I can get really focused in on on uh, outcomes. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know if that's I think that's the nature of when you when your artwork becomes your paid work. Yeah. It's it yeah. can be tough because yeah. there are numbers you have to look at and yeah. there are things that you have to consider as a grown-up in the world. Right. Um but at the same time, when I fir- when my first book came out, I remember I had my first radio interview, and I was a nervous wreck, y'all. <laughs> I mean, I it was like I had to close my bedroom door. Yeah. <laughs> I had to like you know I didn't want John to hear me, my husband, and I don't know why. Like, what's that? Right. He's heard me talk, but I just didn't like the idea. And so I closed my door, and you know I was on this live call. It was a radio thing, and he they asked me a question. And my mind went somewhere crazy. <laughs> it was like, oh, it's such a pretty day outside. I mean, there's like nothing. I couldn't remember my name. Yeah. It was the worst. So I get off that call, that live call. You know, of course it was live. Of course it wasn't taped. Yeah. Of course it had to be live. And I remember like going and doing something really ordinary. Like yeah. I think I washed the dishes or something. And as I was sort of doing that thing that my body did automatically, that's when my mind started to sort of work and sort of pray think. You know how you can sort yeah. of pray think. And I remember sort of saying in the presence of the Lord, but maybe just sort of to myself too, like, I'm just not cut out for this. Yeah. Um, and I remember very distinctly him sort of, um, I don't know if I could say he spoke back to me, but I, I had a sense of yeah. him saying, you're not cut out, you've been placed in. Yeah. And you've been placed into me. And I'm not asking you to manage all these outcomes. I'm simply asking you to come out. That's good. And that distinction was really powerful for me. And it, it maybe didn't give me courage for the rest of forever, but it gave me courage to take my next right step yeah. and to know that, okay, I just have to do the next thing that I'm called and asked to do, no matter what happens with, you know, was that radio interview a mess? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. It was. Let's yeah. be real. But um, it helped to form something in me on the inside, mm-hmm. and that is a work of art. Yeah. And I think paying attention to that is really important for That's us. That's good. Emily, you wrote a book called Simply Tuesday, and it's really inspired me. And you talk in the book about how life is lived in those Tuesday moments. And what that means is we live most of our lives doing the mundane parts of life, doing the laundry, taking out the trash. And you talk about learning to to celebrate those moments. And um, my question is, can you help those of us maybe who feel bogged down in in the mundane, can you shed some light on how you can learn to see those moments as an opportunity to live creatively? I think a lot of it, just for me personally, comes down to carving out margin and fighting for it because it's worth it. I know that for a lot of us, it's everything you just said. Our souls are often forgotten beneath the piles of everyday life. And So much so to the extent, because we can't see them, and so we tend to just deal with what we can see because that's what we do. But I have found that it's more life-giving to enter into those small moments when I have had even just the slightest bit of time in silence. And I think a lot of times we're afraid of silence because we're two things. We're either afraid of what we'll hear in silence, Mm. or we're afraid we won't hear anything at all which is perhaps even more terrifying for some of us. And so it's not to be discounted how scary it can be to enter into a silent, still place and recognizing it takes more work to sit still than it does to stay busy and to stay moving. And anybody who's tried it will attest to that, I think. And just getting real practical here. I will, and I do this often, I will sit down in a chair that I have designated in my house. Um, Sometimes it's when... Everybody is still asleep, but sometimes it's after they've gone to school. I I don't think there's anything magical about the morning. I think just sometimes it's nice because it's the first thing, Um, but it could be in the evening. And I will sit there and I will set my phone timer for five minutes. And my job for those five minutes is to simply sit still without an agenda. And oftentimes I will check that clock like every 30 (laughs) seconds. And I'm like, this is the longest five minutes. But the gift of that, if you look at the other side, 
is, wow, this is actually longer than I thought. And in that space, it can be remarkable what can happen, which is just a deep, a few deep breaths. And I never get up and I'm like, that I had this epiphany during my five minutes. It's not like that. That's not the point. The point is to remind ourselves that we are not in control, that we are small, and that we can sit in the presence of our Father without an agenda. And there's something really empowering. It's, it's a strange, like, counterintuitive thing. It's empowering to do nothing because then you remember, like, oh, there's so many things that I'm, I'm not actually in charge of. And so sometimes that silence can minister that to my own heart. And that helps me then move into the chaos of the day and bring peace with me rather than thinking I can't have peace until the chaos is calm. And so sort of learning how to cultivate. And I don't think you can cultivate it without a little bit of silence and stillness. And it takes a lot of work, but it's worth it. That's so good. Yeah. You wrote a blog post that I read recently called Eight Things Wholehearted Creative Women Do Differently. I loved it. And one of the things you mentioned in the blog is that wholehearted creative women know that art is the evidence and not the goal. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about what that means? Um, if we are willing to see art as um, the evidence of something that's happened on the inside, it really changes how we see failure and success. Because, for example, we have a couple here who's local in town, and and their dream was always to open a shop where they could sell refurbished furniture. And they would sort of take something that was old and broken, and they would renew it and restore it, and then offer it a new life. And so, and they did, and they opened the store, and it was fantastic, and it had been their dream. Like, all this time and the Lord had led them in all these steps and it was this beautiful place. And then they had it for a few years. And then over time they realized like, this is a lot of work and maybe, maybe our dream is changing and maybe we'd like to do something different. And so they ended up closing the store down. And from the outside, it might look like failure to someone yeah. to say, this was your whole dream and, and now you're changing it. But to me, it's almost more like this is evidence that the art is still happening yeah, because it's, it's changing and it's moving and there's there's fluidity and yeah. there's um, growth. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have this idea that growth means bigger, mm -hmm. but sometimes it, it means maturity. That's good. And sometimes maturity might look like shrinking yeah. or smallness yeah. or hiddenness. Right. Um, but we have this idea because we live in America right. <laughs> that um, the success of our work is dependent on some number yeah. and a gr a being further than we were before. Mm. And we say, we measure quote unquote further by saying, well, there are more people listening or right. there are more people reading when in fact maybe there's something larger, mm -hmm. there's a spacious place that's opening up on the inside of me as yeah. the artist. And that counts too. Yeah, I think often our measure of success and failure tends to be externals. But even with what you were saying earlier, that art is a process, you know, and, you know, Corinthians says love never fails. And so if we're interacting with love, we can't fail. Yes. You know, there's no dead end. There are no dead end roads in heaven. You know, it's like, <laughs> I love that, I like you that know, too. but like um, oftentimes, and maybe you could speak into this as well, but our imaginations are a beautiful gift, but they can also concoct some very crazy scenarios. Absolutely. And a lot of times we imagine the way something's supposed to look, or we imagine an outcome. And, and so often our journey is much different than the way we've imagined it. And so I wonder if you, if you have some thoughts on that and how that plays in to the creative process. I have thought so much about imagination this year yeah. and the power of our imagination to both bring life and to bring great discouragement. Yeah. Um, because I think a lot of times we use the word imagine and imagination and we say someone has is very imaginative and we mean it usually positively. Right. And we think like, oh, well, this fosters creativity and imagination. Right. <laughs> but people who are in a stuck place have a very vivid imagination. Yeah. The problem is their imagination is stuck mm. on uh, something scary yeah. and frightening yeah. and maybe keeping them from moving forward. I was reading in a book yesterday, the book is called Shrink and it's by a man named Tim Suttle. And he talks about, um, he was talking about the imagination and he said that how powerful it can be. And he talked about in World War II when the war was over and they were freeing some of the people who were in the concentration camps, it took they would go and they would told the people they could leave and the people, their imaginations were so stunted and were so um, used to being held captive that they didn't leave. Wow. And they almost had to be, they had to be convinced and it's like they had to hear a new narrative long enough yeah. 
to realize they were actually free to go. And that is the power of our imagination. Yeah. So as creatives and as people who, who at PS, I think we all are, right. <laughs> <laughs> as, as humans, that imagination, man, that can take us down yeah. uh, roads of great delight and roads of despair. Yeah. yeah. And we have to choose and be being made aware of that on a daily basis yeah. is the difference between creating in our fullness and our mm. wholeheartedness or creating from a place of scarcity and fear and not being free. Yeah. Isn't that funny? We, you and I were talking about that last night, that we were talking about the uh, internal narrative that is always unconsciously going on inside of us and how that usually comes in pictures. Right, and it all comes down to either love or fear. Yes. And every thought we have is either rooted in love or it's rooted in fear. Absolutely. And we, it's, we unknowingly shape our future based on what we imagine. That unconscious narrative, that imagining that goes on, it's like you've got these unresolved situations in life because we're all in process and so you're thinking about this conversation you need to have with somebody or something like that and you begin to imagine how it's gonna go right and then you get mad right, <laughs> right. or scared right you know <laughs> and and then when it actually happens if you haven't dealt with that if you haven't caught it you go into this with all these preconceived things and i just you know i found myself i was like wow i finally caught that i was like wait a minute no i reject that narrative yes you know and and i think that Maybe that's part of, of reframing how creativity and how imagination works in our lives is leaving room for redemptive imagining to, to become more of a natural part of our process. I just think there is something to be yet to be explored in yeah. this space of creativity and discipleship and where mm -hmm. the role that imagination plays. Yeah. Um, because God gave us an imagination for a reason. Right. And the way he taught when he was here, when Jesus was yeah. on earth, was always using right. story and imagination. Yeah. There's something to be said for that. Yeah. And for storytellers, for us as people who are storytellers, that's really hopeful to me yeah. because when you hear someone talk, you remember the stories they tell. Yeah. You might not remember the three points, but you remember the stories. Yeah. And there's a reason for that. And it's the same for us in our memories. We remember memories as stories, yeah. and that's sort of the story that we tell ourselves. And so really our work as as creative, it's like we, I, sometimes I feel like my job as a writer is I just want to come up with new metaphors so good. Yeah. for people to live by. Yeah. And what does that look like to, to reframe the story, to mm -hmm. be the gospel story in our everyday life? And what does that look like and how can we do that together as community? Yeah. Because that's where our spiritual formation, it's, I heard someone recently say, it's more normative for us to be spiritually formed together than it is for us to do so alone. It's and so sometimes for me, like as someone who, I'm kind of an introvert and I'm right. okay being alone. Right. Um, that's a little scary to think uh -huh. that like, oh, you mean my spiritual formation is dependent on other people? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes it is. No. <laughs> but that's, you know, how it goes. But but that's really hopeful for, because it's it's so interesting if you get, I mean, and maybe you can speak to this too, the, the act of creating, it almost feels incomplete until it's shared. Absolutely. Otherwise, why aren't we all just doing our things in our rooms alone? It's right. like there's something complete that happens yes. when it's released. Because yeah. I know what I wrote, but I don't know what I've said until someone reads it. Yes. And then it no longer belongs to me. It belongs to you. Yeah, and it good. shapes your story. And I don't get to defend it and say, right. well, that's not what I meant. Yeah. Nobody cares what you meant. They. This is now for them. And it's not yeah. my job to interpret it for you. Um, and that's something really beautiful that happens beyond us as artists. It's like we get to participate in something that that has a piece of me in it, but it's not me, and it's not only mine. And that's really beautiful and hopeful and mysterious, and I love it. You mentioned in your blog post on wholehearted creative living that wholehearted creative people see limits as opportunities. And that struck a chord with me because I, for one, have definitely made excuses for limits in my life. I've seen the limits as obstacles um, and reasons not to pursue things that I knew were in my heart to pursue. Um, can you talk a little bit about how to overcome that mindset and how we can learn to see the things that normally 
we would see as hindrances or limitations how we can transform our thinking into seeing those things as opportunities? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I've told the story before about my son who was at the kitchen table one day and he had a stack of computer paper, that printer paper that he got from the printer because of course, every time we go to print something, there's no paper. But he had a stack of that and then he had a whole bowl full of crayons. And I walked in and there were like 15 sheets of paper on the floor crumpled up with a few marks on them. And I realized he was trying to make an airplane, but none of them were right. He kept going and going and going. And I thought in my head, I wonder what would happen if I gave him two crayons and one sheet of paper what would happen is he would be forced to be creative. Because when we have everything at our fingertips, it's almost as good as having nothing. Because everything's a possibility. But when we're given some limitations, now we have to make some choices and then we have to start to think. And so when you think about the way that God chose to redeem the world, the fact that he sent him his son as a baby seems pretty crazy because he was limiting his himself to, um, a helpless, <laughs> a helpless baby who wouldn't even really be full grown for so many years and was depending on this young girl and this young man to take care and to keep him alive. There were so many limits. Don't even talk about gravity. I mean, I mean, there are so many things that were, he chose those limits. Um, and it, that's not the way I'd have done it. That's not the way I choose to do it now in my own creativity. A lot of times I think if only I had more, whatever you fill in the blank right there with, that's your limiting factor. If only I had more time, money, support, attention, if only my platform was bigger, whatever the thing is for you in your particular area. Um, and we can get so hung up on that, just like you said, Sarah, that you see what's not there rather than seeing what's there and sort of allowing yourself to have like a a holy mischief that might come yeah, sort yeah. of like okay well how can i how can i be a trickster here how can mm -hmm. i maybe figure this thing out with all these things that i don't have now now i actually need to depend on someone who is greater than i am mm -hmm. and then trust that my next right step is going to be led rather than just oh well i've got this these all these giant resources so therefore i'll just you know it's sometimes for me i found that I feel more alive in my creativity when I have less time to do it in. Mm -hmm. So like if I know, even just practically, like if I know I have a 12 o'clock appointment, my morning is so much more productive because I have that 12 o'clock appointment. I don't have endless amount of time. Whereas in the summer when my parents take my kids for four days, I'm like, oh, I've got four days. I've got all this time. And then four days is over, and guess what I've done? Right. Cleaned out a few closets. Have I done any writing? No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's something about knowing our limits that is very can be really freeing, which is weird. I read about a study. I don't remember exactly what they're studying, but here's the point, and this will bring it home, <laughs> is there was, they watched these children on a playground in a playground that had sort of was surrounded by two busy streets, but the playground didn't have a fence. And they sent the children with their teacher out, and the children stayed real close to the teacher when there was no fence. And then they had a similar study with different children, different teacher, but they put a mm. fence right next to the streets, the wow. busy streets. And what happened was the children went right up to the fence, mm -hmm. climbed on the fence. Teachers had to pull children off the fence. But it's really interesting how those boundaries mm -hmm. brought freedom for those children. Yeah. And it seemed like, oh, well, there's no fence. They can go anywhere. No, they, they knew that wasn't safe. They knew anywhere that there was no freedom there. But I think about the verse in Psalms that says, your boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Yeah. And so there can be when we feel limited because there are real limits. Yeah. Sometimes there are there is time limits or support or money, but bringing that before the Lord and saying, okay, you say that you set our boundary lines in pleasant places. Show me how is this pleasant? Yeah. And now move in and through me so that I can be my best creative wholehearted yeah. self in yeah. this limitation. Yeah, I think there's such a value in using what you have mm -hmm. and in stepping out right where you are. And I think when you look at the scriptures, I see that over and over and over with God's dealings with us. I mean, even with Moses, and I talk about this a lot in some of my talks, but like, you know, it's when God's telling Moses he's gonna go liberate an entire nation of people, he's gonna stand before the Pharaoh and, Mo and Moses is like, how am I going to do that? And God's like, well, what's in your hand? And he's basically like, well, a stick. And he's like, perfect. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? Go for it. <laughs> you know? And, and I, and I often... Such a great point. I love it. And, and I often think of Mother Teresa and like how she started her schools with a stick in the dirt. That's how she started teaching. She didn't wait for the funds. And um, 
I just believe in not waiting for the resources to come in, but to step out of the boat and and see if you can actually step on the water. And if not, he'll pick you up. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, Emily, thank you so much for sharing your journey and you know sharing your story, your insights, and um, I'm looking forward to subscribing to the next right thing, and just want to encourage our listeners to follow Emily's blog, Emily P. Freeman, as well as uh, follow your podcast, you know, that you just started. And so we'll put links up to all those things on Makers and Mystics. And um, yeah, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks again for listening to the Makers and Mystics podcast. Be sure to leave us a review on iTunes and see the show notes on iTunes and makersandmystics.com for links to Emily Freeman and for tickets to the Breath in the Clay Creative Arts Gathering. This episode is sponsored in part by Matt Tommy Mentoring. You can find out more about Matt Tommy's artist mentoring program at matttommymentoring.com. Music for this episode is provided by my own Songs of Water, and you can listen to our music at songsofwater.com. As always, we'd like to thank our patrons for making this podcast possible. And we'll see you guys soon.